Everything's going as planned. Everything's going as planned. <laughs> That's good. So right now we're just returning some fins. Just in case. Wait. Hey. Hey. This is Justin. Hello. Just yeah. returned the fins to the dive shop a day late, but everything's okay. Everything's okay. We just finished up in Shargao. Shargao, yeah. Shargao, and we are on our way to Dumaguete. We did a little filming out here. We interviewed owner of a hostel called Kermit. His name was Johnny, and he was wonderful. It's actually one of the top hotels on the island. One of the top hotels yeah. on the island. Do you have anything to say about our experience here? I would say my impression of the island was informed by the internet. And uh, they said, oh, it's the number one island in the world, according to Condé Nast Traveler. Uh, and I haven't been to every island in the world, so it's hard to say that's true. But based on my experience here, I would say this is the closest thing to paradise. Yeah, I got a very relaxed feeling from this place. And um, what are we doing in Dumaguete? We are meeting with a conservationist, a young conservationist called Camille Rivera. Uh, and she works at a, sc a scuba diving retreat, but she also works with the community uh, on mangrove reforestation projects. And so we'll be touring in Sayaton and the base on Negros um, Island and interviewing and getting to know some of the community managers that oversee mangrove reforestation. And so she's going to guide us for a couple days there. So we'll find out why mangroves are really important to fighting climate change and protecting the environment and creating sustainable communities. And also why that's really important for maintaining you know, biodiversity. Mangroves have been devastated around the world and they're crucial to protecting shores, um, different fish species, and uh, fighting climate change. And so the Philippines actually has, I think, like 40% of the mangroves in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important that, that mangroves are focused on, and usually they're just kind of cut down for firewood or, or for resort building. And I think one of the main points is saying no mangroves should be protected and integrated. Very cool. All right, we're ready to go. So this whole strait is called Tanyon Strait and it's the largest scape in the Philippines. This is where all the dolphins migrate, there's whales around. This protected area is a complete habitat. We have the mangrove sea grasses, corals. For the past few decades, this area is damaged by rampant, dynamite blasting, uh, pressure fishing, and there are no more fish. Regarding 24 hours, uh, two ships a day. 50 illegal fishing they've mm. caught for the well, last more? six years. Well, yeah. More. Two. More. Before the the water will go into the corals, it's already filtered by mangroves and sea grasses. So we really protect this area because it has potential. It is the uh, nursery for all these organisms. Oh. Hey Camille, where are we and what are we doing here today? So we are in Shaton. It's one of the dense mangrove forests we have here. It's one of my favorite sites in Negros Oriental. You'll see we have a boardwalk and it's one of the um, ecotourism sites here. We'll be meeting Evelyn. She's one of the community members and she's very very active in protecting the forests. She's actually 
that person who can create kind of like an impact to other communities. She's very, very strong. She's very passionate and I love working with her. She can get more people to work with her and plant more mangroves. And that's what's missing mostly in the communities. When you deal with communities, you miss a lot of motivation. And so she's that person that I see that she's so strong about the environmental protection. I think we're all blinded with all the conservation of the corals, the all the seagrass, but soon enough I realized that these mangroves are kind of like the primary shield from the rivers and they get all the sediments coming out from the agriculture land. It's more than just another ecosystem for scientists, but it's, it's a balance between the river, the land, and the sea. There's a lot of places, a lot of islands in the Philippines that are overfished. That's why a lot of agencies, a lot of stakeholders have been trying to look for protection, look for local protected areas so that there's more sustainability in the long run. But people don't see that. People don't see long term, they see short term. And so there's a lot of imbalance, kind of like what the community needs and what the ocean can provide. We're trying to really engage the community. We empower them to get to know their ocean, get to know their marine resources. They need to check what is happening now so that in the long run, they still have more fish to catch. It's basically just food security. So we're trying to connect those dots. So trying to convert abandoned fish ponds to mangroves so we have more juvenile fish that goes into the mangroves and grow more. So those are really connected. This is for you, this is for the future of your children, future of children's children. And I think that's what we're working on, just connecting that first step. Get the mangroves out there and then it will connect in the future. Hi, I'm Justin Davey. I'm a filmmaker, photographer, I'm currently in the Philippines. My initial idea was to create an ocean conservation documentary hitting up multiple different countries, but I was pulled more to the Philippines by different people that I spoke to. And so we're here, we've already been to Shargao, we're in Dumaguete right now, uh, and then we're heading to Boracay. And the three different issues that we seem to be focusing on, I mean, in Shargao is really about surfers' love and appreciation and dependency on the ocean. Um, and how that can teach us how to respect nature. And then here in Dumaguete, we were on the ground with fishermen turned into sea wardens, um, working with Marine Conservation Philippines, really focusing on the importance of mangroves and how important it is to protect those so that people can still live sustainably and, and the importance that the mangroves play within kind of um, fighting not only climate change, but protecting the ocean ecosystem here. And next, we're gonna go to Boracay and find out how maybe this shutdown for six months of Boracay has improved the environment there. What got you interested in filmmaking? When I talk to my friends about this, they all say, well, you were always documenting things. You were always taking pictures and you always enjoyed that. So this is like a natural extension of that. Some people would probably say I can be a little sentimental, uh, more like excessively romantic. So I think that kind of plays into the desire to like, um, find beautiful things or people or moments and capture them and recreate them. For the last few years it's been environmental documentary or journalistic work. Before that it was like fictional short films and experimental films. So it's not really controlled by one medium. Um, and right now like surf photography is really appealing to me. Why is the Philippines an appropriate place to tell a story about ocean conservation? Obviously the Philippines, 7,107 islands, so it's an archipelago and they are completely dependent on the ocean economically um, and have been obviously historically. And so it's a part of their identity and their economy and their culture. And so that immediately makes it interesting to find out what they think about the ocean, how it's treated and what their relationship is with it. And so I think other countries can, who might not be feel so dependent on the ocean can learn from the Filipinos and the way they interact with the ocean. Secondly, it's growing, you know, quite like it's six percent so it's going to continue becoming like a more economically significant player in Southeast Asia and in the world in general it's worth looking at how are they managing that kind of ride upwards in terms of how do they treat the environment how do they create um, poverty alleviation programs how do they create growth without destroying the resources and the reason people come here to enjoy kind of the natural beauty that the that the country has before joining you on this trip, I received some criticism for flying long distances 
to further an environmental cause. Can you give us your thoughts on this? It is easy to criticize, you know, everyone who flies and does all these different things using the contemporary technologies. Um, but I think in order to change the world, we have to meet with different people all over the world um, in order to give more power to the movement of like, hey, we need to create a more sustainable earth so that not only our lives are healthier and cleaner, but then our children's and our grandchildren's. Because I think if you look at the science, you look at the data, it's objectively speaking, it's clearly going in um, not the best direction right now. Well, I, I made that joke earlier where it's like the best way to lower your carbon emissions is to just <laughs> kill, <laughs> kill yourself. Yeah. <laughs> or just sit in a room and do nothing, but I, I don't think you'd be affecting the world um, in, the way that, in, a, in a positive way. Um, so you have to take action in some way, and if that is building um, new networks, new connections amongst diverse communities that share the same ideas um, and desires, irrespective of religion or nationality or race, do you know, that ultimately is how we can maybe shift the world, nudge the world in a, in a cleaner, healthier direction so that our children can have a better life. What sort of feeling would you like the audience to walk away with after watching this film? Uh, I hope they understand the Filipino people or uh, country a little bit better. It's definitely time for maybe new narratives to be made here to kind of for an international audience, not just like a local audience. Hopefully that shows the Filipino people in a way that's more reflective of like what the country's going to look like in 2020 and 2025 versus this you know harking back to like the 80s like it's a different time now the world's completely different and so the country needs new stories so it can be better better understood locally and abroad the title of this piece is bayani can you tell us what this means bayani is a tagalog word for hero the people that i had spoken to said like the concept of redemption or heroism, which is like a, a very much a part of Filipino culture or storytelling. Um, and so I wanted to incorporate that. I think traditionally, like the idea of a hero is very much like the Superman, the Ubermensch, like the individual. And individuals are crucial to like pushing things forward, but I wanted to make the hero of the story actually the you know, the strength of a community. And I've seen that, especially in Chargao, the, the, the strength of the community there. It's really powerful, really palpable. And so it wasn't just like, it, just the individuals, um, but it was like the power of their network together um, created this very warm, welcoming, positive culture that definitely is a part of why Chargao Char Char is so successful. And then also going to Dumaguete to talk to fishermen who became sea wardens, you know, Camille's work is all about working with the communities and so when we met with Evelyn and she manages that 20 hectares mangrove forest for about 40 people you know her her critical role was educating and empowering the locals um, to understand why the mangroves are important and then invest in restoring the habitat and protecting the habitat for future generations so that they have more food but you can't have food security without kind of a collective understanding at the community level and so ultimately like the community is the the hero figure right in any of these sustainability projects we need this kind of positivity especially in, in this day and age where we have a lot of cynicism a lot of myths and disinformation we definitely need honest people who are going to tell stories and work with people of all kinds and and that's also kind of a a sort of heroism right so that all people can have a decent quality of life
work here on Brockay and I'm part of a couple of organizations on the island, um, one of which is the Brockay Foundation, which is a large business group on the island, and then the Friends of the Flying Foxes, which is a bat conservation society. I've been here since I was young, you know, and I finished my degree, decided to live in Boracay, find my future here. I'm uh, working with the Department of Environment and Natural Resources Office. I studied also marine biology because I think that's the way I can contribute to help preserve what remains of our ocean right now. I am the Sustainable Development Manager of Boracay Water. We are working for the protection of the bats and with that the environment of Boracay and the neighboring uh, Panay Islands. How do you think about the ocean? Like when you think about the water, what does it mean to you? I've always been uh, a water baby. I've been a competitive swimmer since I was in sixth grade. Of course from the pool I transferred to the ocean and I just have this special connection with the ocean. I feel calm. Without the ocean it's just like I'm, I feel nothing, you know. It's like I don't know what to do. Everything all I learned since I was small I kinda like put all together in one. People here depends on the ocean not just for their livelihood but also for their food source. And here in Boracay, majority of the people here depends on the tourism that we have. Basically this is our capital. But uh, the ocean is our capital here in Boracay Island. For context, right, from 2006 to 2017, we went from somewhere around like 600,000 arrivals a year to over 2 million. Basically everyone who lived here just understood that like we, we were just not keeping pace, right, on any front really. Like um, transportation, infrastructure, wastewater, which was a major reason why Bracket closed. But when we closed, the effect was there. Then the bad uh, environmental disasters actually affected everybody and that's when people woke up. So I think this is always now in the back head and can kind of be used as a tool that we make sure we don't end up there again. Everybody has to change. During the closure, uh, yeah, we did cleanups. Uh, actually, we collected roughly around uh, five tons of rubbish. Uh, majorities are uh, bottled water. Uh, we have this glass bottled beer. Uh, some other are plastics. What, what are your thoughts on kind of the direction that the development is going in? A little, little good, little bad, right? Like, like great intent very very honestly necessary infrastructure right they had to do it no question but if we maybe would have had another six months to plan this then maybe we could have realized that if we're talking environmental issues we don't want to destroy one of the things that helps us regulate the very thing that we're now building infrastructure to resolve um, and i think that's like very much a picture of the closure they managed to save the bulabo and some illegal uh, tapping on the sewage line. They managed to stop that. And, but some things happening like you don't believe it is just a part of it that they've been done rehabilitation. But it's a part of this like it's not rehabilitation. It's reconstruction. There's a lot of buildings going on standing. You can tell between rehabilitation and reconstruction. That's two types of things. As an environmental organization, and, but also as a private person, as a business owner, you, you always make a stand every day in what you do. And so taking care of our environment, we live with it. You have to. People always say, ah, what do you choose, business or the environment? They go hand in hand. One doesn't work without the other. And in Boracay it's so obvious because no tourists would have come here if it wouldn't be for our beautiful coral reefs, our fantastic beach, and an island as a concept. They don't come here to look at concrete buildings. It's great to find out that a lot of us surfers and kite surfers are now aware of the importance of ocean conservation. This is a good platform for us to voice our uh, passion for the sport, for the ocean, and also for a normal person to understand why we're doing it. Because we all depend on the ocean, we all depend on Boracay, and if we lose Boracay, we lose everything. It's a special island in the way the, pe the people living here, but also the beauty of this island. And so we have to help each other to take care of it. So I don't have a direct answer to why I particularly care more than that. It's beautiful. And we should take care of our home like that.
we are on White Beach in Boracay in the Philippines at sunset at the end of uh, a month, actually, a month in the Philippines, which has been really nice. We were just interviewing Paula Rosales, a world champion kite surfer, kite instructor, and our guide here in Boracay. So we've interviewed many different professionals involved in ocean conservation. They've said many different things. They come from many different backgrounds, but do you feel like there is a common thread between the message that they were giving us? One thing that kept coming up was the need for greater education throughout all groups within the society. So more information about the environment, the natural environment, more education on how to protect it, more education on what damages it and what doesn't and what can protect it. I think that was kind of a common point that a lot of people made. When I first got here, I was like, oh, I'm going to come up with all these ideas. And what I realized was like, it's like you walk into someone else's house and then start thinking of ways to change it. And I just felt like it wasn't my place in Chargao to just start, you know, suggesting ways that things should be different. There's lots of poverty that needs to be focused on. And so that conversation is more about is environmentalism anti-development when they need it so much. And I think that's another point that might need to be discussed here. Yeah, being pro-environment is being pro-development. You can make money by protecting the environment. I think sometimes that's lost. Do you feel like there's a sense of optimism regarding environmental efforts here in the Philippines? I think it's becoming a priority, right? Yeah. But I think a lot of people don't even want to talk about it. Um, people are like scared to talk about the environment because of the history here. Um, people like, warned me not to talk about the environment. Like Talking about protecting the environment would be a bad thing, which is not the way the global society is going. What do you hope people walk away with um, after watching their piece? I hope they can see the beauty of the Filipino people and culture and how welcoming and, and happy they are, especially their ability to share their happiness with people. They give a lot to their visitors. I think often visitors take a lot. You should definitely be wanting to give as much as you can to the Filipino people. If you give them some, some love, they'll give you so much more back. My experience here with Filipinos was primarily with the water sports individuals, so a lot of surfers. So I would play in, play in the ocean, documenting them, the surfers and the surf instructors, and it was really the local surf instructors in Chargao that were having the most fun. Right? They were getting paid to be in the water, but they really connected with everyone, and so sharing those moments with people, uh, I really enjoyed that. What is next for Justin Davey? Probably going to sleep, maybe. Probably sleep a Properly. bit, rest going to Bali next, so I'll be documenting some surfers in Bali uh, for a couple weeks. Yeah. Oh. How do you feel after 30 days with Michael? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we got to know each other. <laughs> I feel good, man. Yeah, it's, it's been really nice. Like we talked about, um, I think that Justin's filming style is a little more romanticized than mine is a bit more realistic. I thought that it was kind of similar to the struggle that the Filipino ocean sustainability movement is going through. And there's this idealistic point that, of course, everyone wants to reach, but there's also this balance with realism, which is I need to get paid or I need to work through this political network to get what I want. I think the film that we're making will probably reflect this in a bit. We want to show this beauty and kind of point to this beautiful past that was there before all the development. Not to reminisce too much, but to look forward at what this place could be and then also use Borokai as a case study into how to do things and how not to do things. In terms of the piece, I, I thought it was really, really great for me to get my reps in and shoot in a few different ways that I did not before. I think in terms of technical ability, maybe I hope I got a little better at shooting. And yeah, it was, it was great to meet the Filipino people. They were so warm and kind and welcoming. This caught me off guard at first, but it felt really good to be welcomed into so many different communities. And it's, the Philippines is just super different than what I'm used to. Like some Western ways of interacting in, in an Eastern environment. Places we went to, some of them very touristy, others more secluded. Now, I wasn't used to being surrounded by so much natural, physical beauty. I think I learned a, quite a bit, so I'm very grateful to the people, to, to Justin Davey, who's like right behind the camera right now. Yeah, I feel blessed. You didn't die. I didn't die.